Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for a learning and growing webinar on AI as a collaborator in teaching. Our presenters today are Andy, Angie Hogman, Hodgman Zickerman, Hodge Zickerman, sorry, and Cindy York of Northern Arizona University. My name is Sidra and I'll be your moderator today for Hawks Learning. We will have a live Q&A session after the presentation, but they have requested that you submit any questions you have throughout the presentation during the presentation so that they can answer them. Um, and I'll now hand it over to our presenter. Okay. You can introduce us. I got to share the screen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as our facilitator said, um, we are, or I am Angie Hodge Zickerman from Northern Arizona University. And this is my collaborator, uh, Dr. Cindy York from Illinois, Northern Illinois University. Uh, we're able to share one screen today, which we are usually in different spots. So that's why you're getting uh, one zoom in versus two. Um, today, we're gonna talk about, uh, back, uh, meet your new collaborator, Generative AI. AI is a collaborator in teaching. So we might talk about some things related to learning, but we really are thinking of you as the instructor designing courses and how can AI be your new collaborator in teaching. So there are lots of types of generative AI out there. Here's a list of some of them. We realize that this list is growing all the time and changing all the time. Uh, feel free to, as you have questions and as you have comments, think about ways that we might not talk about, that you might use some of these, whether they're text generators, um, image creators, educational tools, your usual chat GPT, anything you might think of. If you have some ideas we don't talk about, we are going to have some space for you to share that at the end with the group too. And you can also put into the chat anytime you want. We have the chat open and we can see what everybody is chatting about. So why is generative AI so scary for educators and academics? And I think a few of you have been to a, a different webinar that we've done before and we've asked this question and maybe your fears are the same, maybe they're different right now, but if everybody could take a minute just to um, put whether it's you or your colleagues, why do you think generative AI is so scary for educators and academics? We can see the chat this time, so we can interact. Ooh, the unknown. We're being replaced. No control. <laughs> scared it will take over jobs. This is awesome. <laughs> we want students to do original work. Misinformation. Some of the law. Oh, there's tons. Awesome. We won't be able to read every single comment, but I'd love for you all to keep putting those in there. Changing too fast. I think integrity is huge, right? People oh, this is back. a good one. Students are not learning to think critically. So how do we use Gen AI to help them think critically? What counts as evidence of knowledge will change. That's an interesting way of looking at it too. Lack of understanding it. Yeah. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Okay, we're going to, yep, have to go back and read all of those. Um, but I think it's clear from those of you who are here, you chose to be here, thinking about this, what if we could turn this challenge into an opportunity? What if we could... If we imagine teaching and learning through the lens of G a generative AI, and we have also used kind of a version of this slide before in different talks, and this is we're instead thinking about it again now through the lens of AI as your collaborator in teaching. So not replacing us as educators, but instead, what if we could think of it as, oh, I have a new partner in crime. I don't have to rely on another human being sometimes when generative AI can be my... Or when we are relying on each other, Cindy will say, did you try AI? And I'll be like, yeah, I don't like the answer. I need, we need real brains here. Let's she'll, talk about She'll this. actually send me notes and say, could you uh, read this as a human being and not as gen AI? And, and so that means something to us now. So applications in education, when asking chat GPT, so asking generative AI, what are your the applications in education? So from the mouth of ChatGPT, there are three ways. When we asked it at this point in time that it could apply to education for content creation, so creating lesson plans, educational materials, assessments, personalized learning, and that might be crafting tailored learning paths <clears throat> and additional practice for students. I teach math. So thinking about math problems that might help them learn a certain content, interactive learning, 
I've also done some things like this with math in terms of facilitating Q and A sessions. For instance, thinking about um, talking, pretending AI is a third grader learning um, fractions and having a question and answer session with the AI as if it were a third grader. So what we're gonna talk about is that first one, the content creation. So from the aspect of you are a professor, instructor, teacher, uh, instructional designer, and how can you use it to help you create content? And a lot of times you'll hear, hear people say, oh, well, it'll create your lesson plans for you or your assignments, your assessments and whatnot. But we wanna talk a little bit about um, what happened when we did that? And we did it separately. Um, when I asked ChatGPT, uh, I want you to be my collaborator in creating this. How can you do this? This was this generic output that it gave me. And it, it when you start using things like ChatGPT, you'll see a lot of the output is generic. They use very academic words. They sound great, but there isn't a lot of content in there. And that's part of how we start seeing, as some of you were worried about, the academic integrity of, did our students use this? And so sometimes the the critical thinking part, the why isn't in there, but it says, yeah, we can help you create syllabi and comprehensive and detailed course outlines. Okay, so how this all started was, I was told last March, not this March, I'm sorry, a year ago, 2023, you're going to teach a class about using AI as a collaborator in course design. I had no idea even what AI was at that point. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to have ChatGPT be my collaborator in creating this class on how to use AI as a collaborator. And so you'll see the list of some of the things that we created over on the left, but the critical skills that you need or any user needs is that prompt engineering and that evaluating that AI output. And I feel like in dealing with, I'm I'm a department chair right now and dealing with an academic integrity issue. And that is something, and I also see in the chat, that teaching our students that if we are using AI or our teachers or ourselves, how do we and give the right prompts to chat GPT to get the details we want? Or maybe we still have to use our brains and that's not a bad thing, right? And as we evaluate that AI output, and say, what is it saying? Is it saying what I want it to say? If not, like if you're actually using AI as a collaborator, it is an iterative process and not just a put in, get out, done, you cheated, right? It's more of a, it might sit at your computer for five hours and really dig and learn. And yes, you're helping the, the AI learn as well, um, but you are learning and being really critical if you're using this correctly, even for the things we say on the side. And I wanted to add at the bottom, the or explain a topic at the X grade level means like, can you explain the concept of division to a second grader? Can you explain the concept of division to someone in an abstract algebra course that is a, taking a graduate mathematics class? So asking AI if it can do those sorts of things also is one something else that we've thought about. So we have to be able to teach our students how to do these things as well as know how to do those ourselves. Because once we know how to do these ourselves, then not only do we teach our students how to do it, we're modeling for our students how to do it, but it becomes much more clear to us when our students are doing it incorrectly. Yes. And since we are both very familiar with it, we can almost look at output and say whether or not a student used it with not as a collaborator necessarily, but as a replacement. Yeah. yeah. Words they might not know what they mean or using like, huh, did they mean that? Or let's say some are trying to write their dissertation and I say, there's no content in here. None of this is actually saying anything. It's got great vocabulary, but it's not saying anything. So how I started was, this was my very first prompt into chat GPT. And I said, design a course syllabus for the topic of collaborating with AI in the field of production because they're supposed to produce something in instructional technology. The students need to design and develop a product to use in education and or training. And so chat GPT dumps this great overview course objectives. It had all this fun stuff in it. And I started reading it <clears throat> and realized, well, first of all, it gave me 16 weeks and I needed seven weeks. It was a summer class. 
clarifying topics. So it would talk about the fundamental concepts. So if I go over here, it says this course focuses on artificial intelligence, blah, blah, blah. And it'll mention, understand the fundamental concepts. And I said, well, what, what are those? Uh, this was the free version. This, this was when it first came out, it was the free version. Uh, somebody asked if we use the free chat GPT or the chat GPT four with subscription. So this was pre 4.0 paying for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't even know if there was an option to pay. Right? I don't even remember, but, but I used three point the three point five or whatever that was. Um, and so as soon as it pops out, understand the fundamental concepts and theories of AI and its role. I thought, okay, so I'm the instructor here. I don't even know what those fundamental concepts are. So that was the first prompt I gave it to follow up on. That was, well, what are those fundamental concepts? And so this is where ChatGPT does a really good job. You can keep digging in and digging down and until you, it starts going in circles. Once it starts going circular, you realize you've sort of hit a bump. And as you've noticed, if you are someone with eyes out for integrity, when it starts going in circles, that's definitely an AI thing to do, right? So dig as far as you can. So I was both educating myself as well as trying to figure out what would stump my students and what did I need mini lectures for? So the other thing I did at this point throughout was I would say, well, how would a professor introduce this topic to students? And I asked for suggestions for pedagogy. You know, I need a synchronous, you know, five minute. I need a real life case scenario or a case study. Um, one of the things I didn't know at this point was that I didn't have to write complete sentences and that I could just continue the conversation because as you know, I was learning and so I didn't know that I could just say, okay, this is great. Give me a real life scenario case for this situation without repeating what the situation was. Okay. But and something that I want to add, um, I know it might seem silly to some, but maybe nuanced to others. Don't forget if we are, um, you, if we are using this maybe to train teachers in terms of creating syllabi or even other faculty, you can have them save their outputs and give outputs or if they're students, that way you can see what they've, how they've dug and not just that they put in one thing, got something else out too. So Cindy has shared, saved, and is sharing with you some of the prompts and answers. And this uh, is the actual output. I, so I went back into it and I took screenshots of this. I also gave it to my students in that class. Once I taught that class, I said, here's a printout of all of what I put in to create this class and all of the output that came out of it. But as I went through it, obviously, not only was I learning how to make the prompts better to get what I wanted, but I was learning, <clears throat> I had to evaluate the output as it was coming out to figure out where to tweak it and to what to do with it. And for example, the first one where I said, don't give me 16 weeks, give me seven weeks. And so I was learning how to, to critically think about what that output was and what I know as an educator and what would work with the students. And how to communicate with the AI in a way that it responds to. So it's almost like you're learning their language as you're trying to create this tool, which then if you're thinking about educating future teachers, you're also creating some prompt engineering that they're learning as well. So if they are doing changing these prompts, you could also ask them, oh, how, how did you change your prompts? How did you get what you want? What worked? What didn't work? So they're thinking about their thinking as well. So I also asked it for suggestions for student engagement. And it gave me, a, you know, a lot of information, but it didn't really tell me. Specifics. Specifics. Chat and, and, and some of the chat bots don't give you specifics. They don't give you a good they, they give you the, that overview, that mm -hmm. high level. And so digging into it, or even if you want your students to dig into it, you have to say to them, okay, now take that output. And how do you dig into that? And, and how do you look at the content really? Now this content gets confusing because it's AI about AI. But if you're, if you're having them write something and you say, okay, so why did you choose this over this? So if, if throughout all of this, I had, I don't know, hundred pages, probably of output, I had to choose and make decisions about which pieces I was going to use, how I was going to reward pieces so that they made more sense, how, you know, what order these needed to be taught to the students in, because the gen AI did not produce it the way that I felt was going to be the best way for the students to learn. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I did have it create lectures. So this is how I started. Describe. I interrupt? Yeah. What do you mean by create lectures? Do you mean written lectures? Do you mean video lectures? What was the definition of a lecture? To you? I, and I'm going to tell you. The first prompt I said was describe an educational lecture on interaction design with AI assistance and chatbots. That's all I gave it. Now, it was still in this conversation about creating this course. And it gave me like an overview, an outline. And I said, okay, that's not, that's, that's not what I want. And so later, as I'm going down these, you can see that I start getting into, give me the historical context of this. So instead of describing a lecture and what the outline of the lecture would be, I wanted it to actually give me the content of the lecture. And eventually I got down to the bottom where I said, give me a 15 minute lecture on the overview of AI and its applications. And by this point, it knew what I wanted because I had been prompting it back and forth so much that it would, I would have a written 15 minute mini lectures, what I called them for my students. And so what I used those for was in the class, I would have whatever reading and discussions and everything else we were doing. Here's more information if you don't understand what this topic is. Okay. So some of my students were not teachers. And so here's the mini lecture on the current trends in AI integration and education. And of course, that always just pops out personalized learning. And what the heck does that mean? Oh, it's a personal tutor. But what does that mean? So it's really the digging into it. And so this, I did these little lectures as part of a, um, here's some extra resources you might want. And in giving those to the students, they also knew that they could then take that, put that back into chat GPT or a different chat bot and get more in depth, more in depth. I asked it to design the assignment um for understanding the different tools we use and so it created an assignment gave me an objective gave me instructions it gave me all the good things that go into an assignment and then i realized i needed to give it a little bit more detail of what i wanted so again the prompt engineering give me a short asynchronous assignment to explore this and so as i learned to make better prompts it did better and better at giving me what i wanted for the output now, did I still tweak all of that output? Absolutely. I still modified it. And if you haven't used um, ChatGPT yet for this type of a thing, it is really good. I feel like it coming up with the big, the big picture again, the objectives. It's also really good with outlines and lists. So if you have some different ways you want it to like kind of sort things for lack of better words and again, give that overview. And then if you wanted to get in more detail, you're gonna have to be very specific at engineering each piece of it or tweaking what it puts out before you put it back in, or it will start in more of a circular pattern. So it can kind of give you ideas, maybe help formalize your language a little bit, make sure it's not too much, right, for your students that they can understand what you're reading. But it is nice at kind of getting you started on these assignments. One thing you that chat GPT um, and other chatbots aren't great at is informal language. So if you say, dumb this down, or give this to me in a casual way of speaking and not an academic way of speaking, it will produce a ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous response. Like, Hey, yo dude, you know? And I'm like, surfs up. What? Yeah. I'm like, what? I don't even know what this means. <laughs> so, um, something to think about is to say, have it do the role playing. Like we mentioned a minute ago, you're a professor and you are teaching eighth graders and you need some, you know, the use vocabulary that they are going to understand versus PhD students are going to understand. There's, 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 a, there's a good uh, comment in the chat uh, from Ava saying giving it examples can be very powerful too. So, And now at this point, we can actually do copy and paste and screenshots in there and do images and uploads and things like that. And when I was doing this originally, I couldn't do that yet. Uh, but absolutely, if you say, I want you to write something in this style of writing, it's really good at, at mimicking that style of writing as well. So getting more specific into that prompt engineering, here's one of my prompts and you can see how detailed I am and very specific, you know, what size groups I wanted. Here are all my students that they will be role-playing as. Here's um, all the different kinds of tools I want them to use. And so by this point in me creating this, I knew that I had to get really, really specific in my prompts. And then it gave me, a, it still gave me a, a project assignment. Um, and 
I kept getting closer and closer to what I wanted. Okay. Assessments. Most of the assignments that it created for me, it gave me some kind of an assessment. And up at the top here, you can see, well, 30% should be on this or 20% should be on this. And that really didn't mean anything to me um, because I was going to do, um, you know, however many points I wanted to do. Um, so then I would say, well, I need, here's the component of that project that I need the rubric to be about. So I needed the rubric to be more about the project planning and the implementation versus presenting it or the finished product. And so they gave me a revised rubric. And then I learned, oh, hang on, I got off my slide. I learned this and it can make it into a table. So provide me a rubric in table format. And it's it actually fills in the categories. So this was, this was an awesome thing to learn. Um, but when I first started doing this, I had no idea it could do this. I feel like this could be something too that you could have it create some different rubrics if you have a class for future teachers and they could evaluate the rubrics. Which do you like better? What should you know? What are this the best part about each of the rubrics? There could be a lot done for your own teacher planning, and also if you're teaching teachers and thinking about what makes a good rubric and what makes a rubric not as quality and usable. Yeah. So having even the students evaluating these categories, if you will, these columns and rows, or having them write their own at first and then comparing it to this. The thing I like to use this for is ideas. So my final rubric didn't actually look like this, but I used it for ideas because sometimes figuring out what goes in each section of the rubric is the hardest thing. Now there's other um, Gen AI, um, I think it's like Magic School, maybe it's not Magic School Bus. Um, uh, there's one I'd have to look at there's my list. One, yeah. There's a school one that that's what it does. It creates rubrics. Uh, a question from Shirley. Can the table be uploaded to Canvas? Yeah. So in, in, I was using chat GPT for this. There is a button. It used to be on the right. Now it's on the lower left under the, on the bottom where you can just click it and it does a copy and then a paste. So, um, yeah, this was actually a screenshot. Uh, I was putting screenshots into this PowerPoint. But yeah, when I yeah when I figured it this out, I I got all excited. So, um, but again, as I said, I wasn't using the output directly. I was also modifying it and making it my own. Yeah, and just like we tell our students, be sure that you you try it out. Have a colleague look at it, right? Do the pilot, just like you would with anything else, because it could be that the more general overview, maybe it's exactly what you're looking for, but maybe it, more than likely it probably needs some tweaks, but it'll get you started. Could you use this to create a set of essays to be graded with rubrics if you wanted mm -hmm. to try? Oh, absolutely. I have not tried that, have you? Yeah. Well, no. But I'm sure you could. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, when I did this course, I said, create six different cases. And I gave it the, the details of what I wanted because I wanted to make six groups that were studying different cases about the same topic. And so uh, it gave me the, like I said, I helped, it helped me create all my content. Um, and so we did cases for one of the group assignments and all of the cases came directly from chat GPT. Um, the best one is the first thing I start out students in this class with was come up with a question that doesn't have a yes, no answer and put it into chat GPT and then evaluate the output. And then what I want you to do is take that output and rewrite it, fix it, make it better, trade it with your, with your partner, have them then, you know, evaluate it, edit it, send it back to you. Give me the final output. But I asked them to give me all of the steps. They have to give me the original prompt that went in and the original output that came in. Okay. And the way you get students to do that is not just um, screenshotting or copying and pasting, but there is a link that they can click that gives you the direct link to it. So they can't modify it to what they now are at. Mm -hmm. Since since the, the Gen AI give you something different every single output, they can't fake it, okay? So this shows that they are doing all the steps and not that they just kind of started in the middle with whatever generative AI and then modifying it a little bit and pretending they started with something else. So it really helps you see, it's like, oh, I am using it and here's how. Yeah, so my students kept a journal of all of the prompts they put in and all of the output because I wanted to see what they were doing. Um, 
you can have it grade. You have to give it very, very specific information. You have to give it an example of what you want it graded or how you want it graded. So different things like that um, might take a little bit of prep time and then and then it'll do what you want it to do. Um, so in the Q&A, we have a couple questions about students using AI in their careers. Absolutely, students are gonna use AI from now on, now through the future. It's gonna turn more audio, I think. It's gonna be you know a lot of verbal as it is, is now. I can talk to ChatGPT through my phone um, and instead of typing out all my questions. Um, here's how it goes with the, the careers, uh, you know, medical career with, with private information, corporations with trade secrets, et cetera. They, a lot of times now, the corporations are buying a version of an AI that does not take the data and put it back out into the world to retrain the algorithm, okay? It's the only way to keep it secret is to keep it in-house. Uh, one of the universities in Michigan, one of the big ones, is has an AI that doesn't take student data. Anything the students put in it does not go back out into the training of the algorithm and back out into the world. Now there's new versions. Um, Chat GPT just came out with that a couple days ago and said, okay, if you buy the, dot, the chat gpt.edu version for your university, none of that goes back out into the world. If you're trying to do research with it and you're using something like atlas.ti, which is a qualitative research tool, Atlas says that nothing, no data that you put into it to analyze goes back out. So the companies are understanding right. that we we need some of this data to stay private. Um, so that, you know, that is something to consider. Yeah, ASU has an enterprise version. Exactly. And Ava, we're close. I'm at Northern Arizona University. Feel free to send me an email afterwards or anybody else. So after I did all of that and spent hours and hours and hours and way more than I ever would have used to create a course, I then said, okay, change this course because I didn't like the content it was giving me. And I said, change this course instead of being a production course to collaborating with AI to develop instructional materials because that's really what I wanted. And then I started over again. And some of the, the mini lectures I didn't have to recreate and things like that, but I wasn't really getting out of it the content that I wanted to get out of it. And so it it then it 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 did what I wanted to do. And I've now taught this course three times. You've done something with a math methods course. And so I've done a lot of things where um, you work more, um, I wouldn't say as a tutor, but we give it an assignment in like the math content for elementary courses where um, a, a project that I've been doing with Barbara Boschman's, Brian Beaudry, and actually Cindy, where the project is that the students pick a topic such as maybe fractions. They pick a grade level that they'd like the students to be at, such as third or fourth grade, and they try to interact with the student to see what the student knows, the student being the AI, and what they need to learn, and they have a conversation. The big piece about that is they're having a conversation, teaching them a certain topic, or meeting them where they are, finding their background knowledge and what they'd like to know, but the important thing with that is to that they record everything and they give their entire output because we really want to see like, how are they answering? It can't be more just two questions. They have to think ahead about what they're gonna talk about. And then they also have to kind of think in the moment to change depending on what the AI knows or AI doesn't know. Um, the only downfall is often AI is a little higher level than we normally think what even if we tell it what level that they are a third grader learning this i feel like um, that's because they were trained by academics and they were right. trained by people with a higher vocabulary level there's a couple of questions up here i teach instructional technology so i teach how to teach online i teach you know um instructional design uh, integrating technology Okay, I don't see, we answered those yeah. questions. And already. I teach okay. um, mathematics, mathematics methods courses, math for practicing teachers also, but I also am chair of educational specialties and we house educational technology in my department. Um, so I'm also helping kind of plan our ed tech pro programs, classes. Uh, we're designing an AI for educators course right now um, that we're piloting at NAU, but we'd like to make it available all across the nation essentially by spring. So if that's something you're interested in, feel free to email me. Um, I won't be necessarily teaching, but I'm helping in the design research and collaboration with those AI for educators courses. And I'm currently creating a, an instructional module for um, undergraduate students, gen ed classes, you know, students who are first starting at the university on how to use AI and how to use it correctly, appropriately, ethically, 
all of that. And uh, I'm trying, I'm planning on it only being an hour long uh, module. And we'll put our emails at the end if you have any questions, um, because that is the best way to reach us. Yep. So we're going to take a, a minute here. We like all of our sessions to be interactive. If you're somewhere where you're listening, I do that too. Sometimes I'll go out on a run and kind of make sure that my lunch, I also am listening and learning. But if you can, if you can take a second to uh, collaborate with us to try ChatGPT as a collaborator. Um, can you think of, and well, I'll read through these and we can have a couple seconds and then you can put it in the chat or unmute, either a question that ChatGPT can answer completely for students and then reframe the question or prompt in a way that ChatGPT would create a better question for you to use in your assessments, creates a better question in or output and describe how you could use the output in your classroom or increases student critical thinking. I noticed at the beginning, people mm -hmm. were worried about the critical thinking, but our challenge that we always think about is, oh, how can we make it think better? And then kind of the bonus question to think about is, can you write a question that ChatGPT can't answer? And if uh, if no one can come up with anything, uh, Cindy actually went to a really interesting presentation a couple of weeks ago where she learned something in a way that you can, your students really can't have AI. Help. They can't cheat using AI. So, anyone have anything they'd like to start with, either in the chat or if you want to turn if, your audio yeah, on, you, you can, can do that too. And, and we have quite a few, but if we can get a a couple people, a few people to. I don't know if our moderator has to give you permission to speak or not. Okay, so. You can't give them uh, capabilities to talk, but they can absolutely respond in the chat. Okay. okay, great, great. Okay. In the chat. Her, Eva's trick is to, is to say something like incorporating course materials. Nice, because each course is a little different. Unless I, they put it in there. Unless they copy and paste the course That's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, Gita, in the that's chat fine. function, we can see it a little easier. Yeah, go ahead and stick it in the yeah. chat. We're in a coffee shop and we apologize for that. Uh, we were driving, so. Um, we pulled over. Oh, yeah. Omar, uh, this is kind of similar to what Cindy was going to say. Chat GPT can't give current inf information about current events. Yeah. Can you say more about that, Omar, or anybody else adding on to that? We're reading as they come in. I've so heard people require in. evidence from class discussions. Yep. I ask them to apply a concept in sociology to their personal situation. And a lot of times I think we do that. We say from your own personal experience or in your own classroom or in, you know, can you tell us this? Describe a situation in your life from the last two weeks where you used perspective <laughs> oh, memory. That's oh, awesome. that's cool. <laughs> that's good. That's good. But yeah, chat GPT can invent and make up things. Okay. A question with the last two years cannot be answered currently. Um, that's true, but it can it's, make things up. So depending on how the question is framed, it's pretty good at making up stories. <laughs> okay, I got I got to tell you all, all yeah. the, the question because it's it was just so interesting. So Northern, feel free to keep putting them in there. Yeah, by the way, because we'll read them. Northern Illinois University is in DeKalb, Illinois, and the one of the English professors said, "Ask Chat GPT." what the best restaurant in DeKalb, Illinois is. And then draw, they asked uh, Dolly to make a picture of it. And so it came up with, I don't even remember what, but none of the restaurants were in DeKalb, Illinois. So it couldn't actually answer that question. And the picture it came up with looked like an Italian cafe and it was beautiful. Okay, that is not DeKalb, Illinois in any way. So for the student to use that, it was not, yeah, that wasn't going to work. So, so far, I think questions that have like a best and a place, um, it is not yet that great at answering. There's some good questions in here that I'm not sure the answer is. There's some math questions in here. Um, and can, how does science influence social issues such as racism? I think you're right that all of AI really, the equity piece of it is something that- The bias. Equity, the bias, who is doing the programming and yep. answering some questions that are deep like that. Yep. Exactly. Here's something else that someone said to me once. Every time you talk to chat GPT or any of the generative AIs, it's learning from you. So if you say please and thank you, it will eventually learn to be polite, which also goes the other way. If you 
are telling it that what it's giving you is wrong, even though it's right, it's going to learn that it's wrong. So people can be malicious in using these tools and thus the critical thinking of evaluating the output. A detailed review of a campus play. Well, I like it, right? <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Home 2023 homecoming concert in Mississippi. Yeah, if you have that specific detail, Right now, AI seems to get a little bit stumped. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's part of it is getting the students to critically think. After I gave my students that first assignment that said, come up with um, a not, it couldn't be a yes, no question about our field and, you know, see the, see the result from chat GPT. I then asked them, <laughs> did any of you ask chat GPT to come up with that question, to come up with a question? That, and they were like, oh no, we forgot. So it was even remembering that they could use ChatGPT as their collaborator to come up with the question that they were going to ask. And so the second, my second assignment for that class, I did something a little bit different. And I said to the students, did you ask ChatGPT? And one of them said, yes, I remembered. I remember doing it. Okay. That was a year and a half ago. Now they're all probably going to remember to put it into ChatGPT. So then we have to change our assignments, our uh, assessment to be here is the chat GPT or other generative AI results. Here is what it gave me as the instructor. Now I need to have my students do something to that output, okay? Uh, I think the vocabulary one is great if you're trying to get them to write at a different vocabulary level. Try to write this at, you know, whatever vocabulary level it is. Now, if they're online, it's sometimes a little trickier because you can't see what they're doing. But if you can get a baseline of their writing on day one of your class, if they are there in person, try to get a baseline of their writing, know how they're writing. And then you can compare that to the future writing that might've come out of a Gen AI. Okay, share time, we, we share. just did that. So I wanna to talk to you about this real quick. This was the first thing I found that really helped me um, put sentences and lines in my own syllabi, no matter what I was teaching. It's called sentientsyllabus.org. Uh, it's Creative Commons license. And this is a screenshot of it, but I give you the the website for it. it and we will share the slides too. Yep, yeah, we will. And this, um, when you click on these different sections or Google Docs, um, it will give you wording if you don't want your students using AI, if you want them using it, but they um, need to show um, their output, their output. Input. It, there's so much that it will do. It, um, I talk in my syllabus, there's a line over here about how if they, the attribution and the facticity, if they give me something and they're telling me that it's correct, just because chat GPT told me it was correct. If I find that it is not correct, that it would, the facts are not true. They are then guilty of plagiarism or academic uh, dishonesty or whatever it is. The attribution, if they, if chat GPT or somebody else attributes it to something that doesn't exist or to someone who didn't create it. Or uh, somebody who they think may have, but it's a total random year. Yep. That is falls on the student in my classes because that's the section from the sentient syllabus that I'm using, okay? So go to the sentient syllabus and look through it. Now, your university institution school might have its own um, academic integrity policies, your, their institution policies. See what they are and then make sure that they're clear enough for your own class. And is it following along with what you want to be able to do in your classes? So since I'm telling my students they have to use Gen AI, I have to tweak mine a bit because they have to use it. Um, and also, if you don't like what the policy is at your university, be sure to share your reasons why. Maybe they say no AI, but you want to use it because you're educating educators and you think they should know how it works. They want you want them to feel get a feel for it, do it, use it with integrity. Don't be afraid to, you know, stand up and say why. And you do have this other resource to say, here are some of the options and here's why I would like to use it. And I'm going to teach them how to do this with integrity. Right. And uh, that presentation I was in a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, Put on by English professors. English professors. And they told their students uh, to use Gen AI. And they were talking about how the product... The end result 
isn't the most important thing about their learning, but the process mm -hmm. of learning throughout and critically, critically thinking and evaluating the output from chat GPT or whatever, and making it better. And all of that, that's the piece they were grading. And they weren't necessarily grading that end product. It was 50% end product and it was 50% this reflection. Now they had to teach their students how to do this reflection. So if you want uh, to get hooked up with them, let me know after the, after the fact and I can give you their information. Uh, but they did have students writing reflections um, and it's not a plot summary of what they did, but it was why they did it. And chat GPT can't tell you why. We are putting into a presentation on the reflective piece in math classes. If you see some who teach English, other people can come too, even though we say math are, we would like our presentations to be open for everybody. Um, we just might give some math examples, but don't be worried. You don't have to know the math to understand. Uh, we're putting in for that for the fall Hawks conference. So that is coming. Hawks learning. Yeah. yeah, that is the Hawks learning conference in the fall that we're putting in something for that. And so we'll talk more about that uh, reflection piece and how you might use that uh, with generative AI, but then the reflection coming from the students. And one of the things that those two English professors said was the reason why students are doing it, where they're just giving you the exact output out of chat GPT is because they are afraid that they aren't going to write academically the way we want them to write academically. And because not only are they learning content, but they're learning a different way to present it. So at the university level where we're at, my PhD students aren't only learning how to do research, but then they have to learn how to write it up correctly. And so if they have, you know, I'm not gonna say an easy way out, but it will make them feel more confident if they can put it into something and they take that correct grammar or that correct punctuation. And so the reflections that those professors were using they were not allowed to be chat GPT grammarly. They were not allowed to be anything but that student's own words. Even if it's grammatically incorrect, punctuation was incorrect, spelling was incorrect. They wanted to hear from the students. So one of my thoughts was the other day was video. If the student can walk me through what they did, why they did it and how they did it through video, they're not gonna be afraid of that component of not writing at the academic level. Does anyone interview students who seem to have used ChatGPT to see if they can explain the concepts that were created by AI? Yeah, and that's a great idea too, Anne. Um, I think we're talking about that with the vocabulary. Yeah. Um, if you, I, if I ever get something back, I do take home exams a lot in my math classes and in my classes for teachers, future and um, practicing teachers. I like to have either a video comp part or a part where they're explaining, or if there's something that like they cheat asking them, just say, can you tell me a little bit more about this? Can you explain this page, this paragraph? And I feel like that that helps get at that. And knowing, maybe let them know ahead of time, you might be asked to explain pieces of it as well. Putting it, or sometimes I have them give the definitions in their own words, even if they have something that comes directly from whatever page they found, but their own words is the part that I put the most um, meat into or what they learned. Yeah, I try to use the video, uh, Gast Gaston said something, but with video, they can also get real-time feedback from AI. Maybe in-person and oral would be the best approach. Absolutely. Um, or synchronous video if you're- Exactly, about. yeah. And I've also been giving my students feedback lately via video. Um, so they have a written paper and I walk through it and I call it my brain dump. As I'm reading through their paper, I'm giving them feedback on the paper versus tracking changes and putting in comments because they can just accept the track changes. If they're listening to my video, they're watching it over and over and over to try to understand. And I'm hoping that that, that makes a difference. Um, I did give you a citation for how to cite chat GPT. There's other things out there as well for that. Um, but we also wanna make sure that the ethics of all of this is coming into play. Some of our students have access to the free, some have access to the paid. Does that make a difference? Um, we want to make sure we've got bias covered. What is, you know, how are our students feeling about the outcome or the output from the Gen AI? Is it meeting their um, personal understanding of the world? Mm -hmm. Really? Who is personal understanding of the world? Is it, um, is it, and um, there's actually a conference in August that uh, we're planning to go to as well. It's a free online one thinking about being 
critical of AI. So we're huge embracers of it, but also being critical and looking at the equity piece, looking at the access and the bias to it too. So even though that wasn't a focus of this presentation, we want to let you all know that we're aware of that. And it's something that we are um, definitely interested in learning more about ourselves. Okay. So Tamara had a question about the ability to ask better questions. Can we give a specific example of a before and after type question that increased critical thinking from using AI? Mm -hmm. You did that in one of your math methods classes. We did. And we did that in a, I think, a former Hawks presentation as well. Um, so you can give basic questions, right? Like solve this equation or some really any questions that will give you an answer, a, something that it can look up in its, it's a text predictor, right? So it can look up and give you the answer too. But if you haven't explained why, or you haven't answered the question, give it a question, give it the answer. And now instead you say, evaluate the output. So I feel like I have tried to write well, better questions and AI just keeps answering, keeps answering. It's not as good as mathematical proof if you teach those classes. That's not helpful if you don't teach those classes. But if you ask, ask it a question, have it give the output, and then the students analyze that, and then maybe the students ask a different question. So you don't have to put the onerous on yourself. But I think some of those better questions actually come from looking at the output, evaluating it, telling, is that a good answer? Is that a or even a word problem. Here's a problem. Ask ChatGPT to give a few word problems. Ask five people in class and compare. And then the critical thinking comes in terms of compare your answers. Are they all good word problems? Are they not? Do they make sense? Are they actually real life? Or are they just like a, you know, any 1980s textbook problem? So really evaluating the output or even asking it to come up with some better questions. And then you have the students evaluate the questions. Um, because it is getting better and better at answering things. So we got to keep being creative. So, how we... Right. How looking at that output instead and evaluating that output. I liked it when you asked chat GPT, what, an what math problem can you not, can you not do? You can ask it what it can't do too. And it's pretty honest. Yeah. Yeah. And I, at the time it was things like mathematical proof and things like that, but mm -hmm. ask it what it can't do and then try, see if it actually can't, or if it's kind of fibbing a little bit. Yep. Yeah. And sometimes you learn as you're reading what the students are giving back to you. Right. And you start getting creative. But again, ask, just go ahead and ask chat GPT. It doesn't, how, do I, how do I make more critical thinking come out of this problem for the students? It tends to fluff things up a little bit sometimes without detail, right? Or you, so you could give them an answer and be like, I got this, this answer to this question. It's not really, doesn't have really, and what is it, what is it saying? What should it say? Okay, so I got a question. What attributions do you include in the syllabi that was created with AI assistance? Mm -hmm. uh, the way I use APA. So I did on my page back here with the citations on how to cite ChatGPT. Um, I did that. I also provided my students the whole output and input prompts for the entire class that I created for them um, as a supplemental resource along with the syllabus. Um, I used, when I used the sentient syllabus, this part down here at the bottom where it says parts of the su syllabus highlighted in gray came from sentient syllabus. That was from my syllabus. I, I, I highlighted in dark gray throughout the syllabus what came from sentient syllabus. And the, what you don't see under there was there was a line of what was copyrighted to me that I've written myself. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's how you want to create your syllabi and, um, throughout it, how do you want to cite? So the citations of the things aren't distracting to the students. So I used a highlighted um, aspect of it. Great, nice question and answer by James and um, Urban there in terms of how can technology be simplified? This is where the future lies in specific GPTs or specific tasks, right? I feel like that is the crazy part about AI. It's changing all the time and, and we have to keep up. Yep, so even if you're even if you don't let your student let your students use it, we always encourage faculty to try it themselves because then you kind of know, then you get a feeling for what it can do, what it can't do, or how it might even help you get some ideas for some test questions. I've I've tried that and most of the questions that I haven't liked, but it's helped me get ideas for new questions. I think the best one is when you ask the students, what are you able to do with chat GPT that you don't think the instructor can identify? And that just gives me more ideas of, that. of things I need to watch for. Uh, Jennifer asked, is there a way to detect when a student has used AI when they were not supposed to? 
No. no. Technically, no. Turn it in doesn't work. Um, it might identify it if the student has plagiarized the entire thing, but to be using AI is different. Um, which is why we often just encourage them to use it and cite it, unless you, you know, if you don't want them using it at all, I think you sort of have to be aware that they might still be using it somehow. Okay, what was the name of the site that contained the chat information students can you use that keep the info from the internet? Universities are buying subscriptions specifically, right? Of chat yeah, GPT. the chat GPT dot edu version. Uh -huh. I don't know what the cost is. It's an enterprise version that the universities can purchase. An article just came out on like May 30th. It's really Yeah, new. yeah, a couple days ago. Um I did not use ChatGPT or, or AI to help me create this presentation. A lot of my students did in that course. I did, however, create all of the images that are in this presentation from um, different uh, AI generators. Sorry, we're <laughs> reading some of the chats also. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being such an interactive audience too. Uh, which AI image generator do you suggest, Gaston S? Um, I actually used it, the Dolly, through ChatGPT. I've never, if you it go back here though, and you look at my words, so these street signs here have no words on them. And that can be really frustrating. And I don't have time to go into Photoshop and fix those. So I'm gonna show you another one really quick. I did ask it to make me icons. So here was my assessment icon. And I thought it did a pretty good job of creating an assignment icon. Um, that was all new yesterday, actually. I, I have not tried that yet. Yeah. I need to try it. Yeah. That was, that was fun. Um, but here, so in this, this photo here, that's not very big right now. Um, the, the words aren't right. Okay. So just that right discussions isn't really spelled right. Case stubbly. It's not a case stubbly. It was a case Ooh, study. studies scenarios up at the top has two C's. So it's kind of frustrating if you want it to be accurate with words in the image. Um, and I haven't, but it looks, you get the idea, but right? as a picture, just a generic picture, it, it worked. So yeah, it's just depending if you're using it for art and image creators, there are a number of different ones. If you email me, um, I will give you my list of all of my different AI, um, tools and all the different categories that I have them in. I have a running list. Thank you everyone. And it's okay for it to be scary. It's scary for us sometimes too, but don't be afraid to at least, at least try, right? Because your students are going to be trying or they're not. I have some that actually don't, but they're like, no, no, no. I never want to try that. Lauren, send me an email and I will send you that article directly. She wants the article about the enterprise version for campuses. Yes. It's Thank you, short. everyone. So we're just, it's brand new. We're just learning too. Thank you all. A couple days ago. Thanks. Thanks you. Thank you all for your patience too. I was also uh, trying to feed and water a child. Five-year-old. <laughs> Oh, Ronald gave us some nice oh, takeaways from the meeting. <laughs> that looks like all the time we have today. Uh, thank you, Angie, and thank you, Cindy. Thank you all for attending today. We will be emailing you a link to view the recording of this webinar once it's available. If you or any of your fellow instructors are interested in presenting for our Learning and Growing webinar series, please submit your proposals to the Learning and Growing website, which I'm going to link in the chat right now for easy access. These free webinars are brought to you by Hawks Learning, an innovative educational courseware company. To learn more about our mastery-based course materials and how Hawks can enhance learning outcomes for you and your students, please visit hawkslearning.com, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you all for attending. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Please stay there.